Today in this session we have two very short books to look at. Each has three chapters. And they are two minor prophets who were contemporary with one another and also contemporary with Jeremiah. They are the books of Habakkuk and Zephaniah. And it's not clear which of these men really comes earlier. It's possible that Zephaniah was a little earlier than Habakkuk, but no one knows for sure. Therefore, it seems most convenient just to take them in the order that we have them uh, arranged in our Bibles, which places Habakkuk first. Some of you may have heard Habakkuk pronounced differently. Uh, Habakkuk is how some people pronounce it, and I wondered for years which was correct uh, pronunciation, and I don't know that I ever got a final authority on that, but I had an old King James Bible that that broke down the names phonetically and put accents and so forth uh, on, on Hebrew names. Whether they did it correctly or not, I don't know, but the, uh, Habakkuk was the uh, pronunciation. So if you're used to saying Habakkuk instead of Habakkuk, uh, my apologies, it'll sound awkward to you every time I use the word. In fact, uh, I used to uh, fluctuate so often that even in the course of teaching through the book, I, you know, I'd, I'd, use the na- I'd, I'd say the name maybe 20 times in the lecture, if not more than that, and about half the times I'd say Habakkuk and other times Habakkuk. So I'm going to try to be consistent and call him Habakkuk. Both of these guys um, were, were late prophets, uh, prophesying in the late 7th century B.C. That would be the, the numbers for those years would be early 600s B.C. The 7th century B.C. would be 600 and whatever B.C. And just like we're now living in the 20th century, though the, the numbers of our years are 19-something. Um, as I said, they were both almost certainly contemporary with Jeremiah. The exact date of Habakkuk is unknown because he doesn't give us very much to, to date him by, except that we know that there was the threat of the ba- Babylonians coming, and that, w- and that soon. And we know that Jeremiah was prophesying for about 40 years before the Babylonians invaded, and that means that Habakkuk must have been contemporary with him. Uh, Zephaniah gives his, he doesn't give a date, but he does say he prophesied during the reign of Josiah, and that would put him, of course, contemporary with Jeremiah also, though possibly a little older man than Jeremiah was. In any case, they are short prophets with a single message, and that is the message of destruction. But uh, what is in view in both prophecies is the coming of the Babylonians against Jerusalem and this, this being brought on by the sins of the people of Judah. Habakkuk is a little different, however, not only different than Zephaniah, but different than all the other prophets, in that he doesn't focus upon the sins of the people, uh, and he doesn't speak to the people about what God is doing. Instead, Habakkuk speaks to God about what God is doing. And it's kind of an interesting uh, structure Habakkuk has, because there's two cycles of the prophet complaining to God and getting an answer back from God. In chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 4, we have his first complaint to God. And his complaint is that injustice seems to be going unpunished. Presumably, he means in his own society, in Judah, in Jerusalem, that the wicked are prevailing and they seem to be prospering and there's no, uh, no justice being done. Well, God answers him about that. In chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, where he makes it clear that God is going to take care of that. He's going to bring judgment in the form of the Chaldeans, which is the Babylonians, mentioned in verse 6. And the the Babylonians are going to come in and and wipe out these sinners in Judah. Now, God has given Habakkuk an adequate answer to his first complaint. His complaint was, well, it's really wicked. These people in our society have just, you know, our society has gone to hell in a handbasket. And nothing is done to punish them. And God says, that's okay, I'm going to punish them. Just wait, you'll see. I'm going to bring the Chaldeans, they're going to wipe everyone out. Well, Habakkuk didn't like that answer. Because he thought, wait a minute, how how can you use somebody as evil as the Babylonians, certainly more evil than ourselves, to punish us? That just didn't set well with the prophet. And so he raises this as his second complaint, which is also in chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And uh, basically his question there is, why is it that you're going to use somebody so corrupt? That that doesn't seem just. I mean, we may be deserving of judgment, but uh, are we more deserving of judgment than the Babylonians themselves are? That doesn't make very much sense. 
And in chapter 2, verse 1, the prophet says, I'm going to go and stand on the watchtower and wait to see what God says to me uh, when, he, when he answers my complaint here. This is answering his second complaint. And the remainder of chapter 2, that is chapter 2, verses 2 through 20, are God's answer to his second complaint. Now, his first complaint was about injustice in his own society, internal injustice and wickedness that was going unpunished. God's answer was he's going to punish them through the Babylonians. Then his second complaint was that the Babylonians were an unworthy tool of God's judgment. And uh, it didn't seem right. And so God answers this second complaint in chapter 2 by pointing out that God's justice is just. He will punish wicked people and he'll, he'll save righteous people. Basically, the bottom line is that Babylon will also be judged in time, in due time. In the meantime, Judah is worthy of judgment. And of course, although Habakkuk doesn't say these words, other places in Scripture we do read, judgment must begin at the house of God. There may be other nations more corrupt than the Jews, but the Jews are more responsible because they had more advantages, more knowledge of righteousness. And uh, so judgment rightly begins with God's own people. And if he doesn't judge his own people who fail to live up to the light they have, it's, uh, it'd be questionable whether God was all that just to punish wicked people who didn't have any light for doing the same kinds of things. And God's answer to Habakkuk is essentially that God will judge all sinners, Babylonians and Jews. It just so happens he's going to judge the Jews first using the Babylonians. At a later date, the Babylonians will experience judgment also. And that goes through chapter 2. And when you get to chapter 3, all that is left of Habakkuk then is this uh, psalm that is written by the prophet. It's just a prayer. And you can see, just by looking at it, it resembles many of the Psalms. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigianoth. And you will probably notice that words like Shigianoth are found in some of the Psalm titles. They are uh, the names of musical instruments. And uh, usually the psalmist, if he writes something like that in the Psalm title, is, is stating what instrument he had in mind to accompany this particular song. And at the end of Habakkuk, at the end of verse 19, it says, to the chief musician with stringed instruments. So, it's kind of interesting. Um, it would appear that uh, th this, res this resembles many of the Psalms in having uh, dedication to the chief musician and so forth. And it is simply a psalm of uh, praise to God. Uh, Habakkuk complains twice to God, but once God has given his final answer, the prophet basically says, well, uh, you're worthy to be praised. And in the very end, Verses 17 through 19, he says, no matter how badly things go, I'm still going to rejoice in the Lord. Now, <laughs> there are some things in Habakkuk that figure into the New Testament as, as quotations and uh, very important themes in the New Testament. In verse 5, for example, there is a, a, a verse that Paul quotes to the Jews in the synagogue at Pisidian Antioch. When we come to that, we'll make... Uh, comments about the connection between what Habakkuk meant and what Paul was saying. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 4, we have what could easily be Paul's favorite verse of the Old Testament. It would certainly be a, a rivalry between this verse and Genesis 15:6. Genesis 15:6 says, Abraham believed in the Lord and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This verse says, the just shall live by his faith. And Paul quotes both of these Old Testament passages often together. And more than once, because they, they form the basic Old Testament uh, case for Paul's emphasis on justification by faith. And it was Paul's quoting of these verses, especially in Romans, that influenced Martin Luther so heavily to the Reformation to see that the Roman Catholic Church, in uh, imposing a great number of religious and, and ritualistic requirements on people for salvation, was going beyond the scriptures, which basically taught that justification comes as a result of faith. Now, when we come to Habakkuk 2.4 and comment on it this morning, uh, I'll, I'll point out that there are some interesting, maybe slight difficulties in the way that Paul uses it, but uh, we'll come to that in due time. There's also some interesting, uh, well, a very important declaration in chapter 2 and verse 14. It is not quoted directly in the New Testament, but it is alluded to by Paul. Uh, Habakkuk 2.14 says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This resembles two other Old Testament statements, and it also uh, is, I believe, alluded to. The language of it is taken up by Paul in a statement he 
gives in 2 Corinthians, which we'll look at later on. Uh, these, therefore, even, although it's a short book, there's at least three parts, uh, three verses in Habakkuk, one of them very significant, that is that, that are woven into the New Testament and become part of the New Testament revelation. Now, I've told you something about the outline of the book. We've got the prophet's short complaint and God's short answer. Then the prophet's longer complaint and God's longer answer. Then we have the prayer of the prophet, and that's how the book concludes. Let's go ahead and look at it. There won't be too many comments, I trust, that I'll I'll feel compelled to make on most of it, but there will be some. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Now, some of the wording of this complaint could almost sound like he's talking about the invasion of the Babylonians. Uh, For instance, the wicked surround the righteous, as later did occur when the Babylonians besieged the city of Jerusalem. However, that wouldn't quite be true because Jerusalem was not righteous. That's why the Babylonians did surround them. Uh, The Babylonians were the agents of God's judgment upon a very unrighteous city. This is much more likely a description of domestic injustice within the Jewish society. Uh, The statement that the law is powerless and justice never goes forth doesn't sound like he's complaining about an international struggle, but the fact that the God's law is not observed in the courts. Uh, There is a law which, if followed by the judges and magistrates, would result in justice in society, but the judges are not honoring God's law. The law seems powerless because there's no one loyal to it in the law enforcement system, and therefore justice just doesn't happen. And the last line in verse 4 says, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Uh, In verse 3, he complains that he has to behold all this iniquity and this trouble, uh, which, of course, reminds us that we do live as righteous people among an unrighteous nation, an unrighteous society, and we are grieved by seeing it. At least we should be. Uh, he, he is not happy seeing this iniquity. Now, of course, no one is happy seeing iniquity when they're the victims of it, but a Christian, uh, a godly person, who has sympathy for God's heart about things, uh, is grieved over things that uh, events that they are not personally victimized by, but which they know God is grieved by. We read that Lot, who is not the most righteous man we can imagine in the Old Testament, but he was more righteous than his contemporaries in Sodom, it says in Second Peter that he grieved or he vexed his righteous soul day by day in Sodom by observing and hearing their unlawful deeds. Habakkuk was observing those kinds of things in, in Judah, and it grieved him. It vexed his, stro- his soul. And uh, he cries out to God about it. He says in verse 2, Why do I, How long shall I cry and you don't hear? I even cry out to you about violence. And it doesn't seem to get taken care of. You will not save. It seems like he's saying, God, you are allowing the Jewish society to go to pot. And you're doing nothing to redress the injustices. You're just letting the wicked get away with it. And so God answers him, beginning in verse 5, Look among the nations and watch. In other words, you've got tunnel vision. You're just looking at what's going on in your little society. Something's happening on the international scene that you ought to observe because this will answer the complaint that you have. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. In other words, they're just swallowing up other people's territory. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold and they heap up mounds of earth and seize it. That is, they heap up siege mounds and they they seize strongholds, fortified cities. Then his mind changes and he transgresses and he commits offense, imputing his power to his God. Now, 
what this seems to mean is that the Chaldeans are being raised up by God, as he points out in verse 6. And they go and they, they do their conquests and they win their victories. And then in verse 11, rather than attributing their victories to Jehovah, who gave them those victories, they burn incense to their own deities and give credit to them, which makes them guilty and worthy of judgment too. Um, perhaps you wondered what it means in verse 7, their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Um, it's not entirely clear how that is to be understood. It may mean this, that whereas there are people who obtain dignity and, and office and so forth because somebody appoints it to them, uh, people who are subordinates uh, under greater kings or, or whatever, and they receive dignity that's, that's theirs by appointment from someone above them, the Babylonians are autonomous, they're sovereign. Uh, they are they are rising to power and answerable to no one. Of course, this is not taking into consideration that they are answerable to God. But speaking on in human terms, they are an independent nation. Uh, they they are they don't receive their dignity by appointment from some superior uh, king or they're not vassals of someone else. They are they are rising up as an independent autonomous force, and they're doing so uh, as the most powerful force on earth at the time to conquer all the lands around them. Now he doesn't specify that he's going to judge Judah by the Chaldeans here, although it may be implied. And uh, it's certainly when it says they, they deride every stronghold in verse uh, 10. For they heap up mounds of earth and seize it. It sounds as if that maybe Habakkuk would understand that to mean the stronghold of Jerusalem itself and that the Babylonians are going to seize it. And since God is giving this prophecy, although he doesn't specify Jerusalem, God has given this prophecy in response to Habakkuk's complaint about the injustices done in Jerusalem. It would be it would follow naturally that God is saying, "Well, this is going to affect Jerusalem. What, I'm going to I'm going to answer your complaint by bringing the Chaldeans." And Habakkuk at least could put two and two together that this means Jerusalem is going to succumb to the Chaldean flood and invasion. Now, this answer of the Lord begins at verse five with this verse that Paul actually quotes. Now, Paul, as I pointed out, I think was quite familiar with the book of Habakkuk, partly because he loved chapter 2, verse 4 so much, uh, and he, his acquaintance was more than average because he alluded uh, to and, and picked up language from chapter 2, verse 14 without even quoting it. It seems like the language of the book was woven into his thinking so that he even spoke in the language of the book, even when he wasn't quoting. And therefore, when he quoted verse 5, it cannot be that he was ignorant of its context. He was familiar with the book of Habakkuk. And yet the way Paul quotes it, it raises questions as to what is the connection between what Habakkuk actually said and what Paul is saying. The quotation of Paul, uh, or by Paul, of this verse is in Acts chapter 13, which is in the, the first recorded sermon of Paul. It wasn't his first sermon, but it's the first one that is recorded in Acts. And he was uh, on his first missionary journey, and he was preaching in a synagogue to the Jews of Pisidian and Antioch who were not being very receptive to the gospel. The Gentiles who were hearing him were, but the Jews were not all that receptive in Pisidian and Antioch. And he says to them in verse 40, Acts 13, 40 and 41, Paul says, Beware therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Now, if we didn't read Habakkuk and we only saw Paul quoting this and we, we knew he was quoting something from the Old Testament, but we didn't know the context of the original statement, we might wonder how he means this. Uh, does he mean what they won't believe is the gospel, even though it's being declared to them? Uh, that's, I mean, in, in the immediate context of Paul's sermon, it sounds like he's saying something like that. Because he's saying, if you don't believe my message, then, uh, then you may fit into this description in the prophet, that there's some, God is doing something in the world, which you're paying no attention to. You won't, it's declared to you, but you won't listen to it. Now, the problem with seeing him referring to the gospel itself as the, the work that God will, is doing, that they will by no means believe, even if it's declared to them, is that it doesn't jibe with what Habakkuk was saying. What is the work that God was doing in Habakkuk? One five. What is the work that God is referring to when he says, I'm working a work in your days, which you would not believe though it were told you? 
Well, he t- God tells us what the work is that he's doing. In verse 6, the very next line, for indeed I'm raising up the Chaldeans. In other words, the work that God was doing in Hosea's day was bringing uh, a foreign power against Jerusalem to destroy it as a judgment for their rejection of God's ways. In Habakkuk's time, the people of Israel were corrupt rebels against God. And God was going to do a work that would be so amazing that the Jews themselves could hardly believe it. Now, that the Babylonians would destroy Jerusalem is the work that he's talking about here. And indeed, the Jews didn't believe it, though they were told. They, um, they you remember in Jeremiah chapter 7, they were saying, well, the temple of God is here in Jerusalem. God would never allow anything to happen to the temple. We're safe as long as the temple of Jehovah is here. And Jeremiah warned them that you don't take security in that. And there were many prophets, even after the first two waves of um, uh, of the deportation, that some of the false prophets were saying, well, in a few years, all those things that were taken from the temple are going to be brought back. <coughs> and although Jeremiah and Habakkuk and Zephaniah were prophesying doom on Jerusalem, most of the Jews were not believing it, even though it was declared to them. Now, how does that go along with what Paul is saying? Paul was speaking to an audience of Jewish rebels also. They were not receiving the gospel in this case. He was declaring the gospel to them and they were not receiving it. But what does that have to do with Habakkuk's warning? Well, I personally believe that Paul is saying the same kind of destruction that came on Jerusalem, which the Jews refused to be warned of, refused to take heed to when Habakkuk preached, you're facing a very similar thing. Notice what he says there in Acts 13.40. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. The prophets predicted the doom of, of Jerusalem at the hands of Babylon. He says, now you beware or the same thing will happen to you. Now, someone might say, but these Jews were not in Jerusalem. Paul was preaching in uh, Pisidia, not in Jerusalem. Well, that's true. But uh, if you study the history of it, Josephus points out that in the Jewish war, the three and a half years that uh, culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem, Jews were being slaughtered in Gentile territories all over the Mediterranean world. Uh, the uprising of the Jews in Judea brought general uh, civil war between Jews and Gentiles and extermination of Jewish populations in many Gentile places like Alexandria, Egypt, and in Syria and other places. Um, like 50,000 Jews and 20,000 Jews in some of these cities were wiped out uh, in, uh, in connection with the Jewish rebellion. And uh, so the people in Pisidia, Antioch, the Jews there, could not expect necessarily to go unpunished in this Holocaust that was coming. They were Jewish. They were in the Mediterranean world where this general upset was going to take place. The Jews were going to suffer horrible things. And it was in an event that was not unlike that which came on the people of Habakkuk's time. And so I think what Paul is saying is that if you reject the gospel, you are in danger of suffering something like Habakkuk warned his people about. In his day, it was the Babylonians who had come and destroyed Jerusalem. In Paul's day, with that generation lived to see the Romans come and do the same. And uh, the similarities between those two events in history are striking to anyone who studies both those both of those times when Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews were deported. Okay, now we have the second complaint of the prophet, beginning at chapter one, verse twelve. After God has told him he's raising up to the Babylonians as an agent to use in judgment, the prophet complains that God is too pure, too holy, to uh, uh, to <laughs> sully his reputation by using such ungodly instruments. He says, "Are you not from everlasting?" O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction, meaning the Babylonians. Uh, They're the ones who need to be corrected. They're the ones who ought to be judged, not us. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours one more righteous than he? Now, the prophet has complained that his own people were not righteous. But he, can, he now complains, well, they're at least more righteous than the Babylonians. How can, you, how can you bring this to pass, God? How can you stand by and not stop it when a, a powerful nation comes and destroys a nation that's not as wicked as itself? A nation that's more righteous than the, than the instrument itself. Your eyes, he says in verse 13, are purer than to behold evil. Some people have thought this means that God can't even see sin, but of course that's ridiculous. Uh, the Bible says elsewhere that the the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, uh, to say his eyes are too pure to behold evil and cannot look upon wickedness needs to be understood in the sense that countenancing it. He cannot look with approval upon it. He can't watch it without emotion. He can't watch it without being affected with anger. 
uh, he is he cannot in any way countenance or look approvingly on evil. So how can he approve in, or apparently approve of the Babylonians in their conquest of the Holy Land? Verse 14, why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take hold, excuse me, they take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? Now he is likening the Babylonians to fishermen, uh, just going out into the sea of the Gentile world and with a big net and gathering all the nations through their military enterprise. The net is apparently their military machine because they go out with their net and they bring back their victims, conquered like fish and animals that have been trapped and, and snared. And God is making all these nations, including Jerusalem, Judah, like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no rule over them. In other words, like subhumans. These Babylonians don't treat their captives like uh, very humanely, like human beings. They treat them like animals. And you're allowing this, God. This doesn't make sense. These people, you're, you're blessing their enterprise. You're allowing them to gather these people as fishermen gather fish in a net. And they don't give you the credit for it. They, they offer sacrifices to their net and burn incense to their dragnet. That meaning they worship their own military power rather than God. Of course, God had already pointed that out in verse 11. The guy, the Babylon's mind changes. He transgresses and commits offense, imputing his power to his God. So uh, Habakkuk's not introducing any new thoughts here. He's simply responding to what God has said. That doesn't make sense, God, that you would use and countenance an evil nation like that when your eyes are so pure you cannot be expected to countenance evil. Well, the prophet, I think, has the impression that maybe he's spoken a little out of turn. He says in verse 1 of chapter 2, I will stand by my watch. I'll set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. Uh, he expects God to reprove him a little bit, like he's been maybe a little bit uh, too mouthy with God, and God's going to have to reprove him for that. And anyway, he spoke his mind, as Jewish people often do, especially Jewish prophets, ventilated uh, his uh, thoughts. And he knows that he's in to be taken to the woodshed a little bit here. God's going to come and reprove him for that. Well, I'm going to just wait. Wait for God to come and do that, see what he says, and try to give some thought to how I'll answer him. Well, the way God, Habakkuk actually answers him is in chapter 3, which is a, a psalm of worship. Uh, but here comes the reproof. Verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. Another way to render that last line is that he who runs may read it. Now, uh, the way it reads here in the New King James, that he may run who reads it, almost sounds like uh, if a person reads it, they'll receive encouragement or marching orders or whatever. They will, they'll run as the result of reading it. They will be able to run to the battle or whatever. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what is meant in that, or simply run the good race in the sense that the New Testament uses the word of enduring and, and doing the right thing and against some uh, challenges and so forth. But... Uh, another way to render that last line of verse 2 is uh, that he that runs may read it, which might suggest, since he says, make it plain on tablets, write it, make it plain, so that whoever's running can read it, might mean, you know, put it in big letters, put it in an obvious, plain, conspicuous place so that even a person running by can get the message. A person who's not paying close attention, you know, like a big billboard or something, so that a person who's not particularly listening, someone who's hastily going by can't miss it. Make it that plain. And that is how some have understood the meaning of that last line in verse 2. Verse 3 says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come and will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, the statement, the vision is for an appointed time, in the end it will speak, it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come and will not tarry, is actually quoted or strongly alluded to over in the book of Hebrews. Um, and in Hebrews chapter 10, this is uh, in the closing of this chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, the writer of Hebrews reminds the readers in verses 32 through 34 how that they had in an earlier time in their Christian walk run the good race. They were getting weary of it now, but they had run well uh, when they had first become believers. But now that was changing. And in verse 35, he says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which uh, 
has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Now he quotes from Habakkuk. He says, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now, it's interesting, that that's clearly the, a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, although it reads differently. And the reason it reads differently is that the writer of Hebrews is quoting from the Septuagint. That renders it a little differently. And, that, and Paul always, when he quotes Habakkuk 2, verse 4, he always quotes from the Septuagint. Because, and there's a reason I'll tell you in a moment. But notice in Hebrews 10, 37, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now, I think Christians in reading this, especially if they're not very familiar with Habakkuk, from which it comes, assume that's a reference to the second coming of Jesus. I've heard Christians quote this about Jesus. You know, he, you know, wait for him. His coming, it'll come, even though, you know, he may seem to tarry, but he won't tarry. Well, the fact of the matter is Jesus has, in fact, tarried a great long time since the days that Hebrews was written. That's, I don't think he's talking about what we call the second coming of Christ. One of the issues that the writer of Hebrews has in mind a great deal throughout his book is the destruction of the Jewish system because he predicts it very clearly in many places in Hebrews and seems to allude to it in places not so clearly. Uh, for example, in Hebrews 8.13, he tells us that the Jewish system is about to vanish away. Obviously, it vanished away in 70 AD, and he wrote this shortly before then. In chapter 12, he reminded his Jewish readers that he said, here we have no continuing city. Jerusalem, where they, which was their center of worship, was not going to continue. It was going to be destroyed. There are allusions to the destruction of Jerusalem in Hebrews, quite a few. In fact, I think it was the looming destruction of the Jewish order that in one sense motivated the author to write the book of Hebrews because his readers were Jewish Christians who were tempted to go back to Judaism. He said, hey, there's nothing there. It's sinking. It's going to be gone soon. Don't bother to go back. Even if it was going to be here forever, don't go back. But it's particularly foolish to go back to Judaism in view of the fact that Judaism is on its last leg and is soon going to vanish away. The city's going away. It's not going to continue. Now, in view of the fact that the writer has these things and mentions them in his mind in chapter 8 and in chapter 12, it's not unthinkable that he's thinking of something like that in chapter 10 as well. Jesus did come, not in the sense of the second coming, as we still anticipate, but he did come in judgment on Jerusalem. And his coming in judgment is spoken of in those very terms, sometimes in his own teaching and sometimes in, uh, in the prophets. The coming of Jesus means more than one thing in different passages, depending on context. Some contexts, the coming of Jesus is his coming at the end of the world. And other times, his coming is his coming in judgment at some point in history on some particular people. And most frequently in the New Testament, I should say in Jesus' own teaching to his disciples, I believe that, he, that it applies to the, second, uh, the, the coming of destruction on Jerusalem. Because Jesus said in Matthew 16, I think it's verse 28, some of you standing here will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And he said something similar to that in the Olivet Discourse. He said that generation wouldn't pass before they, the Son of Man came. Uh, and so forth. And I believe that a number of these passages, well, I, for, here's a good one. Here's a, a clear one. When he told the parable of the vineyard, he said, you know, after they killed the son, after the tenants of the vineyard killed the son, he said, what, when he comes, what shall the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants? And the answer was, he'll miserably destroy those people and give the vineyard to others. Well, sure enough, he did utterly destroy those miserable men and gave the vineyard to others. And Jesus announced that that was so. But what's interesting is Jesus said, when he comes, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to them? Well, what he did to them, he did in 70 AD, and yet Jesus refers to that as him coming and bringing punishment on those who killed Jesus. So, when he, the writer of Hebrews says, he is coming and will not tarry, he may be referring to the second coming, but if so, he was, he was off. I don't believe he could be, because Jesus has tarried a great deal, 2,000 years since this was written. But since he has earlier said, the, vanish, the old system is about ready to vanish away, if he's here talking about the judgment Jesus coming in judgment on Jerusalem through the Romans. There's two reasons to support this. One is it didn't tarry. It came shortly after this was written. Secondly, it agrees with what Habakkuk was talking about. Because Habakkuk is saying, or God is saying to Habakkuk, you're complaining because Babylon's going to judge you guys. But don't worry, I'm going to judge them too. But the vision has its own time of fulfillment. In one time, Babylon's going to destroy Jerusalem. Another time, Babylon itself will be destroyed. But just wait for it. In due time, each thing will come. And in the context of Habakkuk, the, the next thing to come was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And when Hebrews was written, the next thing to come was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And I think that the quotation from Habakkuk in the, in the mind of the writer of Hebrews, just like when Paul quoted it in Pisidian Antioch, quoted from the same book, 
I think these writers saw a parallel between their own day and that of Habakkuk. Habakkuk actually wrote, in all likelihood, about 40 years before Jerusalem fell. And Paul and those guys were preaching um, about 40 years before Jerusalem fell again. But the writer of the Hebrews, of course, wrote much sooner than that. And when he says, it'll come and it won't tarry, he's implying it's coming immediately. It's not going to wait. It's coming soon. Now, there's another difference in the way that Hebrews quotes the Habakkuk passage, and that's with reference to the quotation of Paul's favorite verse there, the just shall live by faith. In Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. But the writer of Hebrews quotes it this way. Uh, now, the just shall live by his faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now, that statement, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, is the Septuagint's way of rendering this statement. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. So it's real different in the Septuagint. It's real different. What God is saying in either case, whether we take it in the Hebrew Masoretic version, which our book of Habakkuk in our Bibles renders it from, or whether you take it from the Septuagint's translation, which reads quite differently, um, it, what God is saying in Habakkuk 2.4 is that there's two classes of people. Those that God is pleased with and will be judged, and those who God is I, excuse me, God pleased with and will not be judged, and those who God is not pleased with and who will be judged. Now, those that God is not pleased with, the Hebrew version translates it, the proud, the one whose soul is not upright in him, the person whose heart is wrong toward God. <coughs> the Septuagint reads it, uh, the one who flags or the one who draws back, my soul is not pleased with him. The contrast is with the one who has faith. There are those that God is pleased with and there's those that God is not pleased with. And what the writer, I, I'm sorry, what God is saying here to Habakkuk is, listen, I do not count as wickedness. Whoever is wicked, I'm not pleased with him. Whether that's Babylonians or citizens of Jerusalem, doesn't matter. Whoever is wicked, my soul is not pleased with him. His heart is not upright with him. He's proud. Yes, the Babylonians are proud. So are the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Whoever is proud, I'm angry at him, and they'll get theirs. But, in any case, the one who lives will be the man of faith. The man who has faith will live. Now, here we have another difference between the Septuagint and the Hebrew text, and this is very significant in terms of Paul's usage of the verse. The Hebrew text and the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation, differ in the way they describe the person that God's not pleased with, as we pointed out. One says he's proud, the other says he draws back. A little bit different, but in both cases it's the wrong way to be, and God's not pleased. But there, the Hebrew text and the Septuagint also differ in their description of the man that God is pleased with, because in the Hebrew text, where we read here, the just shall live by his faith, actually the word faith in the Hebrew is faithfulness. But when it's translated in the Greek, in the Septuagint, it's pistis, which means faith. Now, Paul, of course, banked heavily on the translation of the Septuagint when he said the just shall live by faith, by the quality of believing God. Uh, he pointed out that that's how Abraham was justified. Abraham believed God, and it was counted him for righteousness. Also, he says Habakkuk said that, that the just shall live by faith. That is, by believing. Faith is really believing. But that's not what the Hebrew version of Habakkuk actually says. In Hebrew, it is the just shall live by his fidelity or his faithfulness, his loyalty to God. And what God seems to be saying in the Hebrew text, which is followed by our, uh, by our Bible mostly, but uh, however, the translators here were affected more by their Protestant uh, understanding of it than by the loyalty to the Hebrew here, because the last line in Habakkuk 2.4 should read, the just shall live by his faithfulness, not just faith. Now, there is some overlap in the meaning of the word faithfulness and the word faith. But for the most part, those words have different meanings. Faith is trusting or believing. And that's how Paul used it, and he depended heavily on the Septuagint in order to make the point. The Hebrew text, which says, the just shall live by his faithfulness or his loyalty, suggests something somewhat different. Because believing is one thing. Being faithful, being trustworthy, being steadfast, being loyal in the face of adversity is not exactly the same thing. Now, one could argue a couple of ways about this. One could argue that if you have faith, if you have true saving faith, it will be seen in your faithfulness, that faithfulness is a fruit of true faith. If you really are trusting God, you will not defect. If you really are a believer and justified by believing God, uh, then faithfulness will be the result in your life. You will be a faithful Christian. Now, I believe that statement is true. I don't know if that is how Paul meant it. I don't know if that's how Paul meant to interact with the Hebrew text. There is another consideration, and that is that the Septuagint might actually be the original. Habakkuk might have actually written something that more like what Paul quoted in the, from the Septuagint, and our Hebrew text, as it stands, might be corrupted. 
I'm not saying this is true, but it's not an impossibility. What I mean by that is this. The Septuagint was translated 285 years before Christ. Obvious, and the oldest version of the Old Testament text in Hebrew we have is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, that means the Septuagint is about 285 years older than the Hebrew manuscripts that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And therefore, the Septuagint, though it reads very differently in this particular case, might actually, the, the Septuagint might preserve the original reading better than even the Dead Sea Scrolls do. It's possible that when Habakkuk originally wrote it in Hebrew, the word he used was in fact the word for faith rather than faithfulness. But since that time, the Hebrews or Jewish scribes corrupted it and changed it to faithfulness. Maybe because the Jews, the religious opinions of them, didn't think that faith alone was an adequate means of uh, basis for salvation. Now, the Septuagint translators on this theory would have translated correctly from the way it said it in the original. But the Hebrew text that is followed by our versions, which dates from a few hundred years after the Septuagint, may well have been corrupted, may reflect Jewish thinking or rabbinical thinking, that they thought, well, it's, 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 too, uh, it's too easy on people to say that God would save them just by their believing, by their faith. We should maybe alter this just a little bit and say by their faithfulness, because certainly the Jews would believe something like that. Now, I don't know what the solution is. There is a difference in the words in the Hebrew and in the Greek. As I say, what may, maybe the most satisfying solution is to say that the Greek actually preserves the original meaning and that the Hebrew text as we have it uh, has changed and is not, uh, not as accurate. In any case, I believe that both statements, now this is not very satisfying to those who are trying to resolve what the original text said, but either statement is true. Either statement is theologically true. That the, we are justified by faith, but faith that justifies will be manifest in loyalty to God, in faithfulness to God. And if we take the Hebrew text as it stands, what God is saying to Habakkuk is people who draw back or people who are proud or people who are not upright in their heart, people who are, in other words, not right with God, God loathes them. God is not pleased with them. But those who are faithful to God will not die. God is bringing a destruction on the wicked, but not on the faithful. There was a remnant in Israel, in Judah, which included Habakkuk, included Jeremiah, included Zephaniah, included a few others. And this remnant would be saved. They would live. Because they were faithful. There were not many faithful in Israel. But the man who is faithful will, will live for his faithfulness. He will, he will not come under the judgment that is here being predicted. And that is probably the only meaning that Habakkuk got out of the statement. Unless, of course, the original Hebrew said something different than, the modern, than what we have here. It could be that God's statement to Habakkuk was the just man shall live by his belief or by his trusting God. And that would be meaningful to Habakkuk, too, because he couldn't quite understand God's justice in the situation. God could just be saying, trust me. Trust me. A good man, a man who's on my side will trust me, and he'll, he'll be rewarded for his trust. He'll be rewarded for his faith. In any case, uh, it leaves some unanswered questions as to how Paul, um, or why Paul, made such heavy use of the Septuagint in this case. But if, indeed, the Septuagint preserves the original reading better than our Masoretic text or than the Dead Sea Scrolls text does, then that would make... Paul more correct, actually, than, than the Hebrew manuscripts from which our book of Habakkuk were translated. hope I didn't lose him. The, the, the issue of how textual transmission and corruption occurs is, is kind of uh, mind-boggling, but, and we can't really settle some of these things, but I just want you to know that it's a little different as it stands right now. Faithfulness is what it says in the Hebrew here. Verse 5, Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man. He does not stay at home because he enlarges his desire as Sheol, and he is like death. He cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations, and he heaps up for himself all peoples. Who's that? He's talking about the Babylonians. He transgresses by wine. Apparently, means that he gets all uh, he gets all psyched up by getting drunk and and bold and proud, and and uh, he just gets ambitions that a man ought not to have. He instead of being content to stay at home and and enjoy you know the territory God's given him, he wants to take everyone else's too. And it says in verse six. Shall not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. Now, this is the first of five woes here that follow through the rest of this chapter. And these woes are said to be a taunt song that the nations will bring against Babylon someday. Now, you recall in Isaiah chapter 13 and 14, in Isaiah 13 and 14, there was a a couple of chapters about Babylon and its fall, and there was a taunt song there, too, saying, how has he who shook the nations, you know, fallen, and so forth. It's predicted that Babylon will fall. And although in Habakkuk's time, uh, Babylon was gathering up nations as plunder, the time would come when those nations would have the last laugh, where they would taunt Babylon. Uh, 
and pronounce woe upon it. And so we have five woes here. The first is of the one who increases by getting what's not his. That is, the Babylonians are increasing their empire by taking territory that doesn't really belong to them. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you and you will become their booty? Because you have plundered many nations and all, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. Here's the second woe. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You gave shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples. You sinned against your soul for the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Um, Appar- this is a figure of speech. Apparently, the king of Babylon is seen as building up his house or his, his estate, his empire, uh, on the strength of uh, conquest and evil and, and, and bad stuff he's doing. But the house itself will complain. The stones and the timbers will cry out against him. Um, this is not literal, of course. It's like Abel's blood cried out from the ground uh, when Cain slew him, it says in uh, you know, Genesis chapter 4. But the, the point is that the, the evidence of your sin will be crying out to God for, for uh, vengeance. And in this case, in the imagery that you're building your house on the backs of all these nations you've conquered by injustice, well, the, the house itself will cry out against you. And, uh, and uh, God will have to hear their, their cries for justice. Uh, verse 12, the third woe. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. That would be Babylon being built by war and conquest. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire and nations weary themselves in vain? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, this prediction that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea probably in the immediate context suggests that God will make himself known by his judgment upon his enemies, which in this particular case, when he judges Babylon, his glory will be seen in his conquest over that world power. But there's more to it than that. There are two other occasions where essentially the same prediction is made. It was first made, actually, by Balaam. In Numbers chapter... I'm I'm sorry, not Balaam. I'm sorry. It was made by uh, Moses, I guess. In Numbers chapter 14, there's something a little like this said by Balaam, but no, Moses made this statement. Uh, Numbers 14, 21... It says, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now, notice what it said here. All the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Then in Isaiah chapter 11, something is added to it or changed a little bit. And then Habakkuk takes up both statements and combines them. Numbers 14.21 says, the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Isaiah 11 and verse 9 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And then he adds, as the waters cover the sea. So in Numbers, it said the earth will be full of the glory of the Lord. Now in Isaiah, it says the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord and adds, as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk takes both thoughts. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord and the earth will be full of the glory of the Lord and adds, as the waters cover the sea. He puts it this way, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. So he's combining the elements of Numbers 14.21 and of Isaiah 11.9. Now, what is the fulfillment of this? When, Or in what sense is the earth to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord? This is, as I said earlier, something Paul alludes to. He doesn't quote directly this verse, but he clearly has it in mind when he makes uh, this statement in 2 Corinthians 4.6. 2 Corinthians... 4.6 4.6 says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light, notice, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Notice, the knowledge of the glory of God. God has illuminated us by showing us or giving us, shining in our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. That is, in seeing Jesus, we see and obtain the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And we are among those throughout the world, uh, the Corinthians were Gentiles, among those beyond Jerusalem in Gentile world throughout the earth, who were beginning to get the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And they got it through the gospel, through coming to know Jesus. And when it says in Habakkuk 2.14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, it suggests that all the world will come to know Jesus. Now this can be taken in a very literal sense, in which case, 
Uh, it, it may be that the post-millennialists are true because they believe that the whole world is going to become Christianized and that the glory of the Lord will be a universally known phenomenon throughout the world through the preaching of the gospel. Or uh, the pre-millennialists would say, well, this will be fulfilled during the millennium. And, of course, at that time, only Christians will remain or even those who are not Christians will know of the glory of the Lord and that will be fulfilled throughout the earth. Or the amillennialists would basically say, the fulfillment of that is essentially in the church, and it's not so much that every last person uh, becomes a Christian, but that such a huge uh, widespread dissemination of the gospel, a global international knowledge of the global Lord is all that is really referred to here. That as the waters cover the sea, the gl- knowledge of the Lord will cover the land uh, completely. And so that the gospel will be preached to every nation is all that it could mean. I mean, I think the amillennialists would generally understand it that way. Not so much that every last person will become a Christian, but that the way that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord becomes known is through the gospel, as Paul said. God has shined in our hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So as we look upon Jesus, as we are exposed to him, we discover the knowledge of the glory of God in that revelation. And that is, of course, a result of conversion. Uh, Whether this means every last person will have that conversion experience or whether it just means that it'll be widespread globally throughout the world. Uh, The words could be taken to mean either one. And uh, and any eschatological view has a way of looking at that. But it is the ultimate purpose of God that his knowledge of his glory be seen and known throughout the world. And that is, of course, how the church needs to interpret its mission is to spread the knowledge of the glory of God through exposing the world to Jesus. Verse 15, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness and are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you and utter shame will be on you, for the violence done to Lebanon will cover you. And the plunder of the beasts which made them afraid because men's because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city uh, and of all who dwell in it. Now, he says, you drink to exploit your neighbor. You you actually force drink upon him. Get him drunk so you can take advantage of him. Well, God's going to do the same to you. He's going to get you drunk. And we remember the imagery from Jeremiah chapter 25 of uh, all the nations going to drink the cup that God was going to give them and they'd be drunk and stumble. But that was a symbol of them being judged. And also Babylon was one of those that was to drink that cup, according to uh, Jeremiah 25. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, almost everything that these woes uh, include could be applied to Jerusalem. But in the context, I believe the way that the whole series of woes began in verse 6, it in- indicates that these woes are directed toward Babylon when it falls. Verse 18, what profit is the image that its maker should carve it and the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it who made mute idols woe to him who says to wood awake to silent stone arise talking about carved images from stone and wood it shall teach behold it is overlaid with gold and silver and in it there is no breath at all but the lord is in his holy temple let all the earth keep silence before him now the holy temple here cannot mean the temple in jerusalem because that would be uh in my opinion contrary to what habakkuk's whole message is jerusalem and its temple are going to be destroyed it's not the temple in Jerusalem that's permanent, but God has his holy temple in heaven too. And uh, he is in heaven. Man is on earth. Let the earth keep silence before him. Now, this last statement, let all the earth keep silence before him, might be in a sense uh, a rebuke to Habakkuk himself. He was complaining about God's judgments. He was complaining about God's methods. And he said, I'm going to go and wait and hear what I'm told when I'm reproved by God. Well, this may be his reproof. God says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. It's a little bit like Job's, uh, what God said to Job. Listen, mind your own business. You know, you suffer. That's my business. I'm, I'm the one ruling the universe, not you. You just, you know, trust me, really, is what God's saying. And uh, you keep silence and just watch and see what happens. So we have this prayer in the end of Habakkuk in chapter 3, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigonoth. The exact meaning of Shigionoth is not uh, known to scholars. It's one of those words that doesn't, isn't used often enough in ancient literature to, to pinpoint its exact meaning, but it is probably a musical term. O Lord, I have heard your speech and I was afraid. I, o Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God was showing wrath on Jerusalem soon, but uh, he would also show mercy on them 
later. He wouldn't make a complete end of them. God came from Teman, which was a Edomite region. The Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, and his ra- he had rays flashing from his hand. And there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence, and fever followed his feet. Uh, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Uh, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. Now, anyone who doesn't believe that the prophets use figurative language can have serious problems with these. Um, the perpetual hills bowing down to God. The everlasting mountains scattered. Um, <clears throat> this is very possibly a reference back to Mount Sinai because uh, Moses in Deuteronomy 33.2 had a song uh, that remembered Mount Sinai and started with imagery very much like this in Deuteronomy 32, excuse me, 33, verse 2. Although this could be a reference to God's judgment acts in general, only highly, you know, figurative. Uh, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. Uh, You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the waters passed by. The deep uttered, uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went at the shining of your glittering spear. Now, I suspect that what Habakkuk is doing is sort of reviewing God's manifestation of his power in judgment in the past, starting, in fact, with references to um, Sinai. And when he talks about the rivers and the sea uh, fearing God, it may refer to when he parted the Red Sea and part of the Jordan River so that his people could pass forward. Uh, and when it talks about making the sun and the moon stand still, of course, that sounds like a reference to Joshua chapter 10, when God made the sun stand still to give the Israelites an uh, advantage in battle against their enemies. So this may be just sort of a very poetic and figurative recitation of some of the uh, acts of God in judging the wicked and showing his power in the past. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck. Some of this is very hard to interpret. You thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses, through the heap of great waters. That sounds like the ecstasy. Uh, When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. This is apparently his future prediction because he talks up in, through verse 15 of what God did in the past. And now in verse 16, he's predicting what, he's going to do to the, what God's going to do to Judah and eventually to Babylon. It's caused, uh, it caused the prophet to tremble when he heard it and his bones uh, rotted, uh, figuratively speaking. But now he's, uh, he sees that the end, you know, God does the right thing after all. And so he says in verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on the high hills. Um, That, by the way, that reference to making feet like hind's feet and making him like a deer on the hills uh, is taken from Psalm 18, verse 33. It's just a... Uh, recapping of it. Uh, verses 17 and 18 basically say, no matter how much goes wrong, I'm still going to rejoice in God. Now, it sounds in verse 17 like he's talking about agricultural disaster, and it could be. He could be saying, no matter how bad a year we have, and the worst thing that usually happened would be crop failures, well, I'll still rejoice in God in the face of crop failures. Though it is possible that all this imagery, the fig tree, the vines, the olive tree, the flocks, all could refer to Israel. And after all, he has had it revealed to him that's, that the Jews are going to be conquered. And he could be referring figure of that to the fig tree not blossoming, the fruit on the vines. Uh, there's no fruit on the vines. Uh, the, the labor of the olive tree fails. We know the olive tree is a figure for Israel elsewhere. And if the flock is cut off from the fold, that certainly could refer to Israel being cut off from their land. 
Uh, it's not certain if that's how the prophet means it, but the language certainly allows that possibility. So he's saying, even if this destruction comes on my people that I've foreseen here in this, from God, I'm still going to rejoice in God. He'll be my strength. I'll be one of those loyal ones that will live by my faithfulness. Others uh, may not, but that's uh, the only position I can take in the face of God's sovereign judgments. Now, we haven't left much time for study of the book of Zephaniah, which is a, a bummer. It always works out that way. Zephaniah always gets short shrift because Habakkuk can't be covered as quickly as I wish I could. Let me just give you some introductory information about Zephaniah. Zephaniah was apparently a descendant of King Hezekiah. And he lived in the days of Josiah. Now, Zephaniah is the only prophet whose lineage back four generations is given. We have a a more deep root of his ancestry given than for any other prophet in the Bible. In verse 1, it says that he is the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah in the days of Josiah. Now, it goes back four generations and apparently does so in order to show his relationship to Hezekiah. And since he was related distantly from the king Hezekiah, he had some little bit of royal blood in him, and that may have given him access to... Uh, to the king, Josiah. It's hard to say. Josiah's reign was 30-something years long, I think 31 years long, and therefore it doesn't pinpoint the, the date of Zephaniah's writing, but there are other indicators that do suggest a particular date. For example, in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 13, <clears throat> he predicts the destruction of Assyria and Nineveh. Well, that happened in 612 B.C. So obviously... Since he predicts it as future, this is written before 612 B.C. Also, there is in chapter 2, verse 5, reference to judgment coming on the land of the Philistines. Most scholars believe this was fulfilled when the Scythians invaded that area and uh, plundered the Philistine cities in 630 B.C. So that sets it back even further. Assyria fell in 612 B.C., but these Philistine cities were attacked in 630 B.C., so it puts it before 630. Now, the reforms of Josiah were in 627 B.C. Now, remember, when you're going B.C., the numbers go the opposite way of what you think. 630 was before 627. So, if the reforms of Josiah began in 627 B.C., but this was written before 630 B.C., then this was written before Josiah's reforms. I believe Josiah's reform started in the 12th year of his reign. He, he became king at age 8, and I think he was 20 when he began his reforms. So, uh, the fall of the Philistine cities happened when Josiah was about 17 years old, and this happened before that, this prophecy was given before that. So, it's in the early days of uh, Josiah, before the reforms, that this was written. And that is why we see complaints about idolatry so much. Josiah basically eliminated overt idolatry when he reformed things, but he hadn't done so yet. And it's very possible, though we don't have any way of knowing for sure, that Zephaniah's prophecy may have had something to do with influencing Josiah. Now, of course, uh, Jeremiah was around then, too. Though Zephaniah, apparently a bit earlier. And let me just give you an outline of the book, and then we'll go through and look at some of the things in it. Chapter 1 is essentially a prophecy that the day of the Lord is coming upon Judah. God's going to basically wipe them out for their idolatry. Now, this probably was fulfilled by the Babylonians, although it was predicted something like 40 years before the Babylonian captivity. But then Jesus spoke of the, the, the uh, Romans destroying Jerusalem uh, 40 years in advance of it, and he spoke of it as something that would happen you know, relatively soon. Uh, so, uh, the, the time frame is, is, is not unusual for you know in that generation basically Zephaniah was writing within 40 years of the time that it actually happened and therefore although he talks about something being at hand it was at hand in the sense that that generation would not pass before it was fulfilled and God talks about utterly consuming verse 2 I will utterly consume all things from the face of the land says the Lord I will consume man and beast I will consume the birds of the heavens the fish of the sea and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked uh, I guess verse 4, I'll stretch my hand against Judah, against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he tells why in verse 4 and following, because they're idolatry. I'll cut off every trace of Baal from this place. The names of the idolatrous priests from the pagan priests with the pagan priests, those who worship the host of heaven. They're worshiping the stars, apparently. Uh, 
on the housetops and those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but they also swear by Milcom. So these people had not given up using the name of Jehovah, but they also swore by Milcom, who was a, uh, a god of, well, it was, he was the Canaanite god Molech, another name for Molech, is Milcom. So they had Jehovah and Molech that they worshipped. He says in verse 6, those who have turned back from following the Lord. In verse 7, he says in the middle of that, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Now, the day of the Lord is an expression found in many of the prophets and in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the day of the Lord generally, most often, at least in the epistles, I think, is looking forward to the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> but in the Old Testament, every nation had its own day of the Lord. That is, every wicked nation experienced judgment at some point, And when it did, that was the day of the Lord for them. And the prophets spoke, uh, Joel used the term, in speaking of a destruction of Jerusalem by locust plague, he called it the day of the Lord. Amos used the term the day of the Lord for the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians. And Isaiah used the term day of the Lord to speak of the fall of Babylon in Isaiah chapter 13. Here, Zephaniah is talking about it as the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. So, I mean, you've got a variety of ways in which the day of the Lord is used by different prophets in their context. But the day of the Lord was a generic term that meant the day when God has his day, as it were, in court, he, where he gets his way. He seems to be insulted daily by these people, and he doesn't ever seem to be vindicated. Well, the day of God's vindication through his bringing wrath upon those who, who insult him, that is what the day of the Lord is. And, of course, for us, we anticipate the day of the Lord, which will affect the whole world when, at his second coming, the day of the Lord, Jesus Christ, as Paul refers to it in, uh, in his writings. Well, verse 7 here says, The day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. Probably the sacrifice victim is Judah. And the guests who are coming to eat it are the Babylonians. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed in foreign apparel. Apparently they'd adopted the culture of the pagans. Uh, one indication of people accepting pagan cultures wearing the same kind of clothes, the styles that the pagans wear. Um, of course, in our day, styles are kind of international. But each nation had its own cultural dress in ancient times. And uh, there's a sense in which Christian dress probably does need to be distinguished from that of some pagan forms of dress, depending on which ones. I mean, certainly the pagans don't have the same governing philosophies of modesty as Christians ought to, and we are told to be modest. Um, I, I guess the worldly compromise on the part of a Christian can sometimes be deduced by some of the clothing that some Christians wear, uh, immodest clothing in particular, or gaudy uh, attention-getting clothing or whatever. But uh, in those days, the fact that they'd started wearing foreign clothing means that they'd adopted foreign ways in general. They had, uh, they had syncretized their religious culture with that of other nations. Uh, in verses 10 and 11, it names several districts in Jerusalem, the Fish Gate, the Second Quarter, the Maktesh, which was really the market district in Jerusalem as, um, as regions that God will uh, judge. He must be upset with them because of their putting their trust in their commercial ventures instead of in him. Verse 12 says, uh, it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. They just didn't expect the Lord to intervene at all. Like the deists, uh, who didn't believe that God, well, I mean, they believed in God, but they didn't believe that God did anything. They believed that God made the earth and then went off to do something else and didn't in intervene much. Apparently, there were similar people in Jerusalem who said, well, but sure, Jehovah's a real God, but he's not going to do anything. He doesn't intervene. And God says, I'm going to search Jerusalem with lamps and punish them. In other words, they can hide in any dark crevice they want to, but God will bring them to light and expose them and catch them. It's interesting that when the Babylonians did later conquer Jerusalem, they dragged people out of every hiding place, including sewers and tombs and, and dark places where they'd hid themselves, possibly using lamps to find them, but the lamps is not necessarily literal. Um, it says in verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. And then it gives a uh, poetic description of it being a day of devastation and darkness and desolation and so forth. We don't need to go into detail. There all, it wouldn't hurt if we had more time to do so. I don't think it's the most important thing for us to focus on. It says in verse 18, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. Uh, that their silver and gold won't be able to deliver them 
is um, a reference to the fact that sometimes in war, a nation could buy off their attacker. And there had been some of the kings of Judah who had done just that. They'd taken the gold out of the temple and sent it to Assyria to keep them from attacking them and stuff. But in this case, there won't be anything they can do to buy off their attackers. This is a judgment from God, and the, uh, the attackers will not uh, be, uh, they won't be placated by gifts and so forth. Ver- chapter 2. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. Before the decree is issued, before the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Interestingly, Zephaniah, the name Zephaniah means the Lord hides, or uh, can mean the man whom the Lord hides. Uh, He says that the meek and the humble who have upheld justice will be hidden by the Lord. The Lord will hide them like, you know, in a protective place. Now, he's going to search Jerusalem with lamps, and the wicked will not be able to hide anywhere. They'll be exposed, but God has a hiding place for his remnant. God has a way of preserving, in general disaster, those who have put their trust in him. And so we have the remnant alluded to here. Now, verses 4 and following talk about nations on all sides. In verses 4 through 8, it gives different Philistine cities, They were uh, attacked and destroyed by the Scythians in 630 B.C. Verses 4 through 8 name some of them. They were, of course, on the west uh, boundary of Jerusalem. Then it turns in verses 9 through 11 to consideration of those on the east. From west, we shift to east, Moab and Ammon. Uh, Now, they were basically received their due at the hands of the Babylonians at a later time than the Philistines. And... um, So we have him considering those on the west, the Philistines, in verses 4 through 8, then those who are on the east, in verses 9 through 11, which are the Moabites and the Ammonites. Then he looks to the south, in verse 12, and talks about the Ethiopians. Now, Egypt was ruled at that time in history by Ethiopia, and therefore he may have Egypt in mind here. He could call them Ethiopians because they were ruled over by Ethiopia, but To the south of Israel, the the nearest nation to the south was Egypt, and it eventually was conquered by Babylon also, though later than Jerusalem was. And then uh, in verses uh, 13 through 15, he looks to the north at Assyria and says they will be judged. So he talks about those on the west, the Philistines, those on the east, which are Moab and Ammon, those to the south, probably Egypt or Ethiopia, and those to the north, the Assyrians and Nineveh. And he predicts their destruction. Now, these all were fulfilled at different times. Assyria fell in 612, the Philistines in 630. Um, The uh, Egyptians fell to the Babylonians in 568 B.C. So, although they're all mentioned together, they are mentioned not necessarily as all experiencing judgment at the same time, but the day of the Lord comes on them all in its own time. (coughs) And we're going to skip on down now to verse uh, chapter 3. This is the wickedness of Jerusalem. Uh, verses 1 through 7 talk about the judgment on Jerusalem. And then verses 8 through 20 uh, have sort of a messianic uh, kingdom prophecy about the, how the remnant will be glorified. So the destruction of the, of the wicked in Jerusalem is uh, here brought up in the first seven verses. Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted to the oppressing city. This is Jerusalem. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. Now, the oppressing city we could think to be Babylon, except it refers to Jehovah as her God, and therefore Jerusalem is obviously the city in mind. Uh, Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. They're supposed to be shepherds of the sheep, but they're more like lions. Her judges are even wolves that leave no bone till morning. They eat up the people and leave nothing behind. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. That's something Habakkuk also complained about, that the law was powerless and justice was never done in Jerusalem at that time, about the same period that Habakkuk was writing about. The Lord is righteous. He is in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He never fails, but the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made their streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. 
you will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off despite everything for which I punished her, but they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. God says, I, I figured you'd certainly turn around if I judged you in this way. I mean, how could you be so stupid as not to? But it turned out you are more stupid than I counted on, and you corrupted yourself anyway and did not receive correction. Now we have, in the closing verses of the book, uh, a kingdom passage about God's glory upon his remnant, ultimately, which, as you know, of course, some would interpret to be fulfilled in a future millennium. Others take it to be figuratively referring to the church age under the Messiah, those who are the people of Christ, the people of the Messiah. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations, which, of course, is done through the preaching of the gospel, to my assembly, to, to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation. Well, this is done, actually, uh, them would be, I think, Jerusalem in 70 AD, but this is, uh, I don't have time to give all the reasons for it. You know my inclinations. Uh, all my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language. I wonder if giving the gift of tongues on Pentecost was a, a sort of an emblem of this. A God changing their languages. That all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. That is, people from Gentile lands, even further away than the rivers of Ethiopia. Well, you know, the first Gentile convert in the book of Acts was an Ethiopian. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, it might be an emblem of this being fulfilled. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, God has Gentiles who become uh, worshippers of his. In that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and uh, you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and a humble people. That's what Jesus that's the remnant who survived the Holocaust in Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Blessed are you meek, Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, they inherit the earth. Jesus said the meek will inherit the land. The, the meek survive and obtain the inheritance where the rest of the Jews are wiped out and lose their inheritance. And they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. Jesus said of Nathanael that he was an Israelite indeed because there was no guile in his mouth. In whom is no guile, Jesus said in John 1, 47. They don't have any guile or deceitful tongue in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. In John 12, 31, Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Our enemy was cast out at the cross, according to John 12, 31. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. Actually, the word disaster, literally in the, in the Vulgate, in the Latin, is fear. You shall see fear no more. And uh, Christians certainly have seen disaster in an earthly sense, but uh, we don't have to fear ever again. We're told not to fear. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in the midst of you is a mighty one. He will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you in his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God will give them peace. Uh, he will rejoice over the remnant, which are now referred to as Zion. Of course, in the book of Hebrews, we're told that the Zion that we have come to is the church of the, of the firstborn, the general assembly and church of the firstborn in Hebrews 12. Also in Hebrews 12, it says, therefore strengthen the feeble knees and let not the hands hang down. There's a reference perhaps back to here too. In verse 16, Zion, let your hands not be weak. In other words, be encouraged. Weakening the hands is to discourage. Verse 18, I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly. Jesus said, uh, blessed are those who mourn. In Matthew 5, 4. In Ezekiel chapter 9, those who were spared the Holocaust of 586 B.C. were those who mourned and sighed, cried and sighed over the sins of Jerusalem. Jesus said, Blessed are you who mourn. You should be comforted. He says, I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly, who are among you, uh, to whom its reproach is a burden. 
there were that remnant who were burdened with the same burden of the Lord, that they were upset and mourned, uh, burdened in their heart over the reproach that was brought on, this, on God's name and the worship of God by the Jews in general who had defiled the sanctuary. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time I will bring you back. Even at that time I will gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Now, when I return your captives... This, of course, he has predicted the de destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. This was fulfilled. The remnant, a remnant, was brought back from Babylon. God did gather them back and give them their temple back and give them their religious system back. But, of course, that's only a type and a shadow, I believe, of, in general, God uh, saving his people in the Messianic age as well. The uh, exodus and the return of the exodus from Babylon both being a, a frequent type and shadow of that. So I personally think that this last section, though it has language uh, that resembles the return of the exiles from Babylon right there at the end, and probably does refer to that, it refers even beyond that to the time when all the nations will, be, will be, have a pure language and God will restore a pure language to the people that they may all serve the Lord and people from beyond Ethiopia and so forth. This, I think, did, was not fulfilled when the Jews returned.